Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Pori Ranch stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! The first one is titled, Your bad driving caused you to not get hired. Background, I work for a construction company that has many divisions but I work in the new construction section. I've been working at this company for about 5 years but actually worked along with my dad who had 30 plus years at the same company. Because of his long tenure in not only the field but with the company I got a lot of inside perks. I created a lot of very beneficial professional relationships through him. My dad recently became very sick, suffering from liver and throat cancer stage 4 and had to stop coming to work. My dad and I were the only office guys in the department, so once he stepped away I became number one guy in the department, making all the decisions. This detail will come into play later. The crime, I recently got engaged to the woman of my dreams. We had planned on getting married in 2018. But with my dad being sick and not sure how long he will have, we moved it up to fall of 2017. So we are getting all of the wedding planning stuff done as soon as possible. This last weekend, February 11th, 12th, we conquered a lot of the list. The incident happened on the 11th. We had just finished our registry and about to meet our DJ at a local coffee shop but had some time for lunch. We grabbed a quick meal before he headed to our meeting. As I'm pulling up to the stop sign to leave the parking lot into the street and car pulls in tight and cuts me off a good 10 feet before the stop sign off of the street. Now, usually I have horrible road rage fingers, cuss words, and sometimes I've thrown crap from my car in fits of rage. My fiancé hates my road rage and I try to behave myself as much as possible when she is in the car. So when this guy cut me off all I did was throw up my hands in the air in a, what the hell gesture. He was driving a Chrysler 300 and had Illinois plates. I can't stand Illinois drivers. A lot of those dickheads from the rich Chicago suburbs come to my town for school and they drive like buttholes. As I threw up my hands, he slammed on his brakes and looked at me. Rolled down his window and asked, what's your deal? I respond with, you cut me off. Don't know how to take turns very well? He's responded with, want to get out of the car? Yes. At this point that is all my head is screaming, but when he asked this my fiancé grabbed my arm and said, please don't. So I looked at him and said, no I don't want to get out of the car, I want you to learn how to drive. His response was to call me a pussy for listening to my idiot girlfriend and drive off. He hit all of my buttons in the matter of a minute. Bad driving, not apologizing, and disrespecting one of my loved ones. If she wasn't there in the car, there would have been a fight. I thought that was the end of me seeing that butt hat and I was not happy. Karma was on my side. The revenge, since my dad has left work, my responsibilities have doubled and that caused me to stay later and even come in on weekends. My boss, seeing my struggle, asked if he could hire someone to help take some of the load off of my desk. Since my dad leaving, I've pushed to have one of the field guys take over because they already know a lot about what's going on and wouldn't have to teach much to them. My boss didn't like that idea because he didn't want to lose one of our great field guys. He put some ads out to hire someone, but promised me I would be part of the hiring process and would even have the last word with hiring since I would be working them a lot. Like Santa bringing you everything you asked for on Christmas morning that butt hat that cut me off walks through the front door asking about the opening. He hadn't seen me yet, and being in the company car when I drive to and from work he didn't see my car either. My boss took him to the conference room and asked the basic questions while I was finishing a bid we wanted to send out. Then came my chance, my boss called me on the speakerphone asking me to come back to finish the interview. I usually hate Mondays but this felt like the greatest Monday I could ever have. Right when I walked in that room, the butt hat's eyes lit up and got real big. What made it even better is as I'm walking in, I hear my boss tell him that I'm coming to finish the interview and would be his boss and we wanted to make sure it was a good fit. The interview went poorly, like really really poorly. I barely roasted him with any difficult questions because he was so nervous, freaked out that his answers to my questions were horrible. My boss then took me out the hallway after I was done and asked what I thought. I told him the whole situation and said I could never work with him. That was all my boss needed and said we will keep looking for a new replacement. Best part is I got to tell the guy the news. I basically told him to get the duck out and laughed at his face about trying to get a job here. 
Funniest part actually, is he told me he already had other job offers at some of my competitors and was just shopping around. Idiot actually named the competitors who he claimed had offered him jobs. What he didn't know, is that our company is actually really close and friendly with our competitors. I called up those companies and told them what happened and they not only told me they did not offer him jobs but now they definitely want. The next one is titled, Dad has a long memory. My dad told me this story several years ago. The numbers aren't exact, but the general idea is there. Dad owned and ran an auto body repair shop for over 30 years, until he retired about 5 years ago and sold the business. He was the face of the business, the person the customers dealt with. In case you've never had the pleasure of taking your car to a body shop, the way it generally worked was this, you wreck your car, come into the shop for an estimate. The insurance company sends the body shop a check for the repairs minus your deductible, and you pay the shop the rest when you pick up your car. There were exceptions. Sometimes, for various reasons, the insurance company would pay the deductible as well. Like I said, this was a small town. And not a very rich one. There were quite a lot of people for whom the few hundred dollars for the deductible was a lot of money. Having to pay it all at once might mean choosing between not paying rent or not buying food that month. Dad could sympathize. He grew up dirt poor. And I mean that literally. The house he grew up in had dirt floors until he was in his teens. He once told me that at night when he went to bed in the winter, he would sometimes have to brush snow off of his bed from where it came in through a gap between the wall and the roof of the house. So he understood that kind of poverty. And he understood that for many people, going without their car wasn't an option. The public transportation where we lived wasn't a viable way to get to and from work on time. Dad wouldn't want someone to be without their car. Yet he also wanted to be paid for the work he did. So if they couldn't pay the deductible right away, he would let them pay in installments. Whatever they could afford. $50 a month. $20 a month. Dad wouldn't even charge them interest. One day one of the local pastors brought in a friend to get his car fixed. It being a small town, and dad being active in the community, he of course knew the pastor well. Let's call the pastor's friend's name Gerald. Now as it happens, Gerald turned out to be a real con artist. But dad didn't know that at the time. The estimate was written, submitted to the insurance company, and a check was received. When Gerald came in to pick up his car, he said the insurance company would be sending a separate check to cover the $500 deductible. This was a small town, so people generally trusted one another. And he had come in with a pastor, so dad took him at his word. He handed over the keys to Gerald's car, and Gerald left. A few days went by. No check from the insurance company came. Dad called Gerald, who assured him the insurance company told him the check was on its way. A few more days went by. Another call. Another excuse. A few more days go by. Finally, Dad gives up and calls the insurance company directly. The insurance company, when asked about the check for the deductible, replied, nope. He's responsible for that himself. We're not sending a check for it. Dad calls Gerald. Tells him to pay up. Gerald says he'll come down with the money. Days go by. No Gerald. Dad calls. Gerald has stopped answering his phone. After a few more days of this, Dad goes and files a claim in small claims court against Gerald for the deductible. At the hearing, the court says Gerald has to pay the deductible plus some fees. Unfortunately, says Gerald, he doesn't have any money with which to pay. Nor does he have any assets Dad can seize. The car wasn't even in his name, so Dad couldn't even take that. Dad seethed. He fumed. But not being one for criminal retaliation, there was nothing else he could do. He realized that Gerald, being the scumbag that he was, had set out to swindle him from the start. Worse, he had succeeded. And so, having won the moral victory but nothing else, Dad moved on. Years passed. As I said, Dad was active in the local community. He knew many of the people in the town from fixing their cars, or being in any of the many civic organizations he was active in, or just from having lived in the town for 40 years or so. When he would drive down the street in town he would look at the driver of any oncoming car, and wave to that person if he knew them. Which he usually did. One day, who should he see coming toward him in a newish Dodge Grand Cherokee? That's right. Gerald. Gerald, who likely didn't look at the driver of any oncoming traffic, didn't notice Dad pass him. 
he probably didn't notice Dad do an illegal U-turn on the US highway that ran through town. Nor did he likely notice Dad catch up to him so he could get the license plate number of his car. Dad, armed with the small claims judgment and friendships with every law enforcement officer in the county, had the license plate number run to see who the car was registered to. Can you guess who the owner of that car was? That's right. Gerald. By this time Dad had started a side business towing cars with his brother. So when he went to the court to ask to repossess the car, he asked the court if he could be allowed to go and get it personally. Which he was. He also asked for interest on the original amount owed. Dad knew that the maximum amount of interest you could charge on a car in Michigan was 24%. Dad, not being greedy, only asked for 20%. Compounded monthly. Plus court costs. Plus an impound fee. Plus a daily storage fee. All told, Gerald now owed Dad somewhere around $900. So Dad and his brother went to Gerald's house with one of the sheriff's deputies to get his car. Dad greatly enjoyed the look on Gerald's face when he realized what was happening. The car got towed back to the shop. The next day Gerald came in with the money. As he was counting it out to Dad, he realized gasped. He was $100 short. Darn it. Dad took the money. Counted it again in front of him. Put the money away. Wrote Gerald out a receipt. And told him that when he came up with the other $100, he would get his car back. Gerald said nothing. Also, Dad said, there's a daily storage fee. Gerald continued to say nothing. And then he left the shop, got back in the car he came in, and left. After an amount of time that wasn't sufficient to go anywhere and collect $100, yet long enough that someone as dumb as Gerald might think would fool Dad into thinking it was, he came in with the last $100. That he likely had in his pocket the whole time. He collected his car, and left. We think he was just hoping Dad would say, hey, close enough, and he would get away with paying less than he owed. He didn't know my dad. Interesting coda to this story, some time later Dad told this story to an attorney friend of his. When Dad explained how much interest he charged, the attorney was shocked. It turns out that the 24% interest maximum only applied to car sales. In a case like this, the maximum was something like 6%. So the court shouldn't have allowed that much interest, and Gerald paid Dad much more than he was legally entitled to. Dad didn't seem to have a problem with that. The last one is titled, You Want to Blackmail a Helpless Young Girl? Be ready for the revenge then. Everything started when I was around 16. I was drugged, sexually assaulted and very traumatized from that event. I couldn't remember much from it, only the cold feeling and some smells, so I could never actually press charges against the rapist. Also, I was very alone in the whole situation, aside from a few friends I had, I had no one to actually rely on. My parents were emotionally awful towards me so I learned not to trust them from my young age. And telling them about my problem was out of question. I just couldn't do it. So, it happened, and it took me a lot of strength to get back to my normal self. I was depressed for a long time, developed anxiety and became self-destructive, I drank way too much and did way too much drugs. During that time, I met a guy, let's call him Douchebag, DB for short. I met DB over Facebook, he claimed to have met me in the club, which was possible. Yes, I went to a club when I was 17. No, I didn't even need fake ID. He seemed nice, and I even met him over a cup of coffee for a few times. After a while, I started really liking him, but there was something just very off about him. And I couldn't put my finger on it. He was one of those rich kids, spoiled little brat, who liked to pretend he was very scary and important, mafia style. DB was also five years older, and because he had money, I never heard him talk about doing anything other than football and going to clubs. I found it laughable, but I let him believe what he wanted. He also acted like he liked me in a sexual way, but didn't do anything about it. There were just some remarks that made me think that way. He was also friends with people from my high school, and this is important. I hung out with him and we did regular stuff, got coffee, talked, I would rant about my parents, he would joke with me. Just normal stuff. After a few months of our friendship, I even told him what happened to me when I was 16. He didn't show much emotion and asked a few questions that seemed too much, but I didn't think much of it. I was just glad I told someone. Months went by and I was less and less self-destructive. It dawned on me I needed to change my ways, stop with the drugs, alcohol and stupid friendships. That's why when DB asked to meet me for a coffee, I told him no. 
I realized along the way that he was shady as ducking hell, his friends were weird. I had no idea how he spent his days. He treated me with little to no respect, and he always chose small shady cafes to meet with me, as if he was embarrassed by me. I have had enough of it, and told him so. What I told him didn't faze him at all. He left me alone, as if I never mattered. After a few months, I started hearing rumors about myself. They were so nasty, so incredibly horrible, and the whole school talked behind my back about it, or even to my face. I was called SL asterisk T and whatnot, and spiraled into depression once again. I didn't think DB would do it because from time to time he would contact me and acted very nice, and also he was not exactly the only person who could hate me. You know how high school is. The crap hit the highest point when I was 18, almost 19. By the time I somehow managed to deal with nasty crap people were talking about. I managed to deal with threats of violence and name calling. I also found a beautiful boyfriend, he was my rock, someone who I could rely on, someone who took care of me and gave me comfort and safety. I was with him for six months, and I have told him about my past. I thought it was important for him to understand why I was who I was. I kept my boyfriend very private. I didn't share our relationship on Facebook or any other social media. I didn't talk about him a lot. Only a few people knew about it and that was the best decision I ever made. DB contacted me from time to time, he kept telling me I changed and joked how he liked me better before, because I was spontaneous and fun to be with. Yeah, because doing ducking drugs and being suicidal in my free time was so much fun, right? I stopped speaking to him completely, and again, he didn't seem to care. It was one month before my final tests in high school. I was going to school, studying hard and hung out with my boyfriend, I was trying very hard to fix what I ruined years ago, and that was me, my reputation and my grades. I was in school one day and checked my inbox on FB, which I almost never did, just to find a message from some guy the first have never met, asking if I was there. Against my better judgment, I told him he might have sent the message to a wrong person, and he immediately answered that he hadn't. I was puzzled, sitting in my German class, and staring at my phone. I asked who is he, and the guy started insulting me, calling me a whore, and told me I will do what he tells me to do, otherwise he will put the video of my assault online. I was now freaking out, to say the least. I thought he had to be joking, and told him so, and that is when the worst message of my life came. It was a picture. Of me. A detailed picture, to say the least. I felt so sick. I got up, without saying anything to the teacher, and got the hell out of that class. Barely holding myself together and bawling in panic as I stared at my phone. The first thing I decided to do was call my boyfriend. I could barely speak over the phone. I was hysterical, so he picked me up and took me to his place. I told him about everything and then it started to make sense, all of it. DB had to be a part of that crap. My boyfriend told me to keep talking to the guy, while he called a few people to see who this guy was. He seemed to be in his 30s, had a dog and lived in the wealthiest part of the city. His Facebook profile was legit, he existed and wasn't afraid of me knowing his real identity. I asked what he wanted from me. I would almost puke every time I had to answer, but I had my boyfriend with me, and he was furious. The guy knew my address and my mother's name, and threatened with that too. He said I can choose if I wanted to get naked on cam or have sex with him. He's ended up demanding that I meet up with him and have sex with him. My boyfriend told me to invite the guy to meet with me in the open, we knew he wouldn't want to sit and drink with me coffee, but my boyfriend couldn't let me just go to the address. This is where we made a plan and it was going to go down the very next day. I had to meet with the guy on a little square near his place, surrounded by a park. It was remotely abandoned at that time of the day, and I sat down on a bench, shaking and trying to keep myself together. My boyfriend told me this half of the plan, but didn't actually tell me what he will do. Finally, I was approached by the guy. He seemed younger than I thought, and wore that smug smile on his face that made my blood boil. He told me to get the duck up and follow him. I was now terrified, looking around for my boyfriend, but he was nowhere to be found. So I had nothing else to do than to follow the guy. We were walking on a path, I was few steps behind him and he wasn't even looking at me. I was staring at the ground, concentrated on not fainting. All of a sudden, the guy stopped in his tracks. I stopped too. In front of us was standing my boyfriend, right in the middle of the path. The guy seemed confused, and turned around to me, just to notice two guys behind me, my boyfriend's two best friends. 
They were just standing there, calm and silent. Now, I didn't exactly describe my boyfriend, but this is the best description in a sea full of little fish, he was a goddamn shark. Older than me, his face full of scars and he radiated that superiority. He knew how to be scary. I suddenly could breathe. My boyfriend's best friend moved me out of the way, grabbing my hand and pulling me in the other direction before crap starts. I was so stressed at that time that I could barely walk, and just as I rounded the corner, I heard a muffled scream. My boyfriend's best friend took me to my boyfriend's place and hugged me while I cried, until my boyfriend came back. His hands were bloody, his shirt too, but I could see he wasn't hurt. At that time I didn't ask what they did, but my boyfriend assured me I was safe now. Later I found out they beat the guy and made him tell them where the tape was. They crashed his phone, and went to his place where they destroyed all the blackmail material in front of the guy. He admitted he was the one who assaulted me, he stalked me and even sent his friend DB to befriend me so he could control me and get info on me. DB was in on it the whole time. Later, I found out DB became well known for abusing barely legal teenage girls, along with the guy. They would blackmail girls and make them do nasty stuff, and all the girls were alone just like I was. DB ended up getting beaten too, ending up in hospital, and the guy moved to another country soon. I asked my boyfriend if he did something to them and he just laughed. T I'm just happy it ended and I don't even want to know. I'm still with the same boyfriend. We truly delivered pro revenge. Thanks for listening.